preparing photopolymer letterpress plates. We're going to start in the darkroom. Whenever you go to the darkroom, knock, stick your head in a little bit and see if anyone is in there, and then flip that light on. That reminds people out in the studio that someone is in there working. And we're going to go to the exposure unit in the corner, the same one for photo etching. We start by pushing the power button to turn the machine on. It needs a couple of minutes of warming up. When we want to reset the amount of light we're going to be using, in this case, we actually need 300 light units. You start by pushing the enter button and that will blank the display. In this case, we have to change the decimal place as well. So you hit the 1 over 10 fraction. And then hit the enter button again, and then hit any numbers you need in order to set the light. In this case, 300. So over on a work table in the darkroom, we've got a small cutting mat, knife, thin sharpie, scissors, a negative transparency, and this stuff, photopolymer letterpress plate material. There are two sides to it. There's a shiny side, which is the back, and a more flat or matte side, which is the top. That's the good side. This stuff cuts pretty easily. You could use scissors if you wanted to. I find a very sharp X-Acto blade works best. And when I say very sharp, I mean unless you're sure that you've recently changed the blade, it's a really good idea to snap a new one. Taking a ruler and my fine sharpie, I can make marks right on the top of the good side, the upside, the top of the photopolymer letterpress plate, the side that is matte in surface. You can mark it carefully at both ends. In this case, I need four inches, and I'll use my sharpie to connect those two lines. I also know that I want this plate to be five inches wide, so I'll double check it against my negative transparency, see that I have need for at least a five inch plate, mark that with my sharpie, and then proceed to cut. Now the best way to cut this material is, as I said, with a sharp X-Acto knife. And it's not to attempt to cut it all at one time. It's at least a couple of millimeters thick and it's plastic. You have to be very careful with knives and plastic because they have a tendency to catch the blade when you're cutting and pull the blade up over a ruler and onto your finger. And then you've got a bloodbath. So you begin with your sharp knife and then you're going to line up your ruler and cut three or four times, a little at a time. By the fourth cut, you should have gone all the way through. You shouldn't be straining. You shouldn't feel like you're gonna lose control. You could do it in more cuts if you need to. I wouldn't recommend doing it in less. It's important to note that this material, like photo etching film, or like silk screens, need to stay in the darkroom until they have been exposed. So, we're doing this work in the yellow light darkroom. Here's my plate, and we're going to move back to the exposure unit. So the exposure unit is on, and it's been warming up, and carefully opening the hasps, will lift the glass with two hands. You never want to do this with one hand. The glass is spring-loaded and has a tendency to go flying up and it could potentially break. Here's our plate. There's the good side and our transparency at the bottom of the screen. Now, very simply, I'll remove the thin frosted coating from the good side, the top side. What you'll notice right away is that the plate begins to curl. It curls up up in the direction of the material you just removed. So you don't do this until you are right about to use it. You can see it's curling already. So placing it more or less in the center of the exposure unit, we're going to take our transparency, in this case a negative, and place it face down. Here's a close-up view. There's our negative. We're flipping it over so we can see the back, and we lay it down on the plate. It's much easier with two hands. When you think the plate and the transparency are in the right position, slowly lower the glass, engage the hasps, and 
turn on the vacuum. There's the vacuum switch. Once the vacuum has sucked all the air out, remember to remove that red film out of the way. One last check to make sure that nothing has shifted. Close the curtain and we're ready to press start. It's important, like any time you use the exposure unit, not to look directly at the machine. Here's what it looks like from a safe distance. But you are going to be exposing for 300 light units, which is a few minutes, so you might be better off out in the hallway. We've sped up the film here, and that's what the machine looks like when it turns off. So, reverse order, turn off the vacuum. We're going to open up the curtain, flip the red film back into the place, lift the glass, and take out our plate. Unlike Pure Etch, unlike Pure Etch, there's no latent image. You don't see anything on the plate until we begin to develop. So, moving over to the small developing sink, we reach over and find the cord to turn on the yellow lights. And here I'm going to just point out where I'll find other things we'll use later, a small brush or the large brush. And they live on that shelf. So we get a small tray, placing it in that sink, and with hot water, as hot as the tap can generate, we begin filling up the tray with water. Careful, the hose has a tendency to want to go everywhere but in the tray. So do your best to, to hold it in place and begin running hot water. And now we take our plate and put it into the hot water. If we have a little plate, we're going to use this brush. This is a little baby brush. It has a charming bell inside, but basically soft bristles. And gently, we will begin wiping the surface of the plate. You can already just make out the image on the plate after having been in the water for a couple of seconds. This process takes at least five minutes. It might take 10 minutes, depending on the size of your plate. So you're gonna see me here rubbing pretty gently, but everywhere on the surface of the plate, the good side, the upside, the side that had been protected by that mylar. And what is happening is, all the elements of the plate that were hardened by light, that is where my drawing permitted the light through from the exposure unit to harden, they will remain at the full height of this material, a few millimeters high. Everything that was protected, that is, didn't get any light, will eventually rinse away in hot water, and you're beginning to see it happen here. How do you know when to stop? Well, for sure, five, six, seven minutes is a useful indicator, but truly, you pull the plate out every so often and you have a look. If you look in the corner here, it's a little bit cloudy, a little bit foggy. That's an indicator that there's still some material to come off. If it's right around the edges, it's not a big deal. But if it is in the bulk of your image, in the central part of your image, or around your text, for example, you're going to need to carefully and gently continue scrubbing. That said, this plate is done. If you happen to be using a larger plate, you can use this larger brush. It doesn't really help. In fact, it's a bit of a hindrance if you're doing a small plate. But if you're doing a larger plate, this brush works the same as the little one. We're now in the small dark room, the room where we normally prepare Pure Etch or our silk screens, and we need to heat this plate. So we're not simply drying it. We're not doing this for just 30 seconds to get the water off. In fact, what we're doing is we're putting the hairdryer onto high and heating this for about five minutes. Now, if you have a larger plate, it might take a little bit longer. There's no real indicator for when you've finished. You just time it. Five minutes seems like a long time. It kind of is, but the plate needs it in order to harden. Now it's safe to have our plate back out in the main studio. And there's our plate on the right, and there's our transparency, a negative transparency, as I keep saying, because this is different than most of the things you've used in the past on the left. And when we examine our plate, you'll see that the edges, in this case, the parts of the plate where light was able to hit, uh, have become hardened as well as the drawing itself. And we need to affix double-sided, special double-sided tape to the back of this plate for the printing process. We're not gonna talk about printing today, but this is a necessary part of the operations. So you take this large roll of blue double-sided tape, expensive, fancy double-sided tape for letterpress, 
place your plate down on it and again using a sharp exacto knife trace around the edge and cut this film the film this this tape film is very very thin I'm not cutting the plate here I'm just cutting the film and I can roll it up and put it away for the next person to use last thing before we could potentially use this plate is to cut it out and here's where the scissors come into play I'm gonna take my scissors and I'm gonna cut around all the way around my image trying as best I can to stay away from the image itself and to never have sharp corners I'm going to be cutting curves all the way around this plate now when I come back into frame here you're gonna see just that I, I want to avoid being close to the image the the kind of border that you're seeing all around this plate is in fact just that it has nothing to do with the image it was just where my transparency didn't cover the rest of the material. So I cut all the way around and now my plate has been backed with two-sided tape and the blue you're actually seeing is a, is a transparent covering which we can reuse. This thing is called the boxcar base. You'll see where this goes in just a sec but this is a really fancy expensive small heavy machined piece of aluminum with a grid on it and this boxcar base is the key to how we can use such a thin plate such as the polymer plate on a letterpress which typically needs something called type high 0.918 of an inch high to print so this base plus the height of this material this polymer plate gives us type high and there is our plate mounted on our base when we're finished printing, and this obviously hasn't been printed because it's perfectly clean, we can use a thin pallet knife to remove our plate, and then if we've saved our plastic backing, we can re-coat it. This plate could be used again. Whether we've used it today or whether we're waiting until another day to use it, we're best storing this plate somewhere out of light and relatively flat. So if you have a horse book, and I use the term horse book liberally here, if you have a horse book such as this, you can place your beautiful horse plate inside of it, flat and stored for later. 